today I'm at the Civil War battlefield of Chickamauga, and I'm here to learn about World War I. Learn more about that fascinating connection coming up next. These like bags of tents. This is this is all the personal gear. The okay, personal gear. Um, what what the standard army issue gear was uh, for the soldiers. Uh, backpack that you have um, on your shoulders. It's got a trenching tool, a small shovel for digging a foxhole if you need to. It's got a pouch for your your mess kit, which has a change pouch. Um, it's got room in here for an army blanket. Uh, uh, maybe a change of shirt okay. uh, and space for oh, cool. some rations that might be kept. Excellent. Even though the soldiers were fed from a central um, uh, kitchen that was preparing, preparing food for everybody, the soldiers didn't have to cook their own food. But they still would carry uh, emergency rations if they needed. On, on, the, on the bottom of your pack, there was another pouch that was attached like this. And this is a half of a pup tent or a small tent. That, that you, with your buddy next to you, you could, I could take my half and I could take my buddy's half and button them on top, button them on top. And there's tent stakes and tent poles in here and you can make a tent that would sleep two guys. And that's uh, what that part was. There was an ammunition belt. You could carry 100 rounds of ammunition along with a metal canteen and a small um, first aid dressing. Then, of course, all your other personal hygiene stuff, your toothbrush, uh, your shaving kit. Uh, the, the soldiers had to shave every day, and their, and their corporals would make sure that everybody, everybody shaved every day. So you didn't see any beards in the world. Really, I shouldn't even have my mustache. Um, if I was in France, it's my, even my mustache right here. Why would you have to be clean shaven? Why was that such an important deal? Because it's kind of hard when you're camping outside. Particularly if you're camping in, in a cold, wet, muddy place and you've got to shave every day, that's kind of a hassle. Well, during that war, um, poison gas was used. Uh, the Germans started using it first and then the Allies followed suit. So poison gas was a common feature of that war. And the men had to stay protected against the poison gas that was in the air if, if a shell had gone off. So everybody was issued gas masks. And this is the style that the American Army used. And if I was close to the front, I'd have to wear this on my chest, this close, this close to my face, so that I could have my mask on, put on my face within seven seconds of hearing the alarm. Because uh, the poison gas was deadly. And in order for this mask to fit closely to your face, you can't have any facial hair, or else poison gas might sneak in underneath that. So you had to be clean shaven for that mask to fit. You could button it together, and you'd have a tent. And there's also tent stakes. And Collapse and take all that as well. So, um, and then you'd be carrying an ammunition belt. You'd carry 100 rounds of ammunition or a canteen. That hasn't changed much. So we'll how did they get, uh, like when they ran out of ammunition, I mean, how did they get stocked back up? Was there just well, somebody that had ammunition that just fell Exactly, yeah, there were, there were, you know, for, for every man that's in combat, there's, there's a whole line of guys supporting him. And, um, yeah, in, in a really heavy fire, that could be a problem. But, but there, yeah. were, there were mechanisms for okay. getting the guys on line. Supply. Supply. Exactly. Okay. Most, of, most of their food uh, was cooked behind the lines and brought up to them already fixed. Okay. Okay. It wasn't always food. Well, <laughs> <You're right. laughs> but it was food, right? It was food. So it's not like they, had to, <laughs> like they were making the campfires individually. So it, um, yeah. you know, th this was a... By 1970, 1980, it was pretty mechanized, industrial. I bet, I bet. And I guess, yeah. well, I guess they had, I guess maybe some of that probably happened for the Civil War, Yeah, it did, maybe? exactly. And it's, you know, wars are always terrible. In human I mean, costs. it is an act of organization. Though. But but you learn from the prior war. And, yeah. Yeah, and by, by, by 1917, we had 
European models to look at, how they were doing Because the Europeans had been fighting that war. We didn't get involved until 1970. The war started in 14. So the French and the British, our allies, had been fighting for yeah. three years already. Yeah. Before we finally get involved. So, so we had a lot. And, and they sent, even here, check them out, they sent, they were French, Canadian, and British liaison officers to help us get our army trained. Because when, when we entered the war, uh, Congress declared war April 7, 1917. Our army was 300,000 men compared to what France and Britain had, where they had millions. millions. So it took us a year to get our army built up to the point that we could even have an effective fighting force in France. So that's what was going on here, was getting all this training and experience down so that when we finally sent, sent men to France, they um, they need to rest. Were there other training areas around the United States? All over the United States. Okay. And that's why yeah, they, were, they were grabbing any, any land they could find at all. Sure. In, in Georgia, uh, in addition to the one here, there was a camp in Macon, there was a camp in Atlanta, there was a camp in Augusta. And, and the, the, the American South had a lot of these camps because our climate was better. And you could do training more year round mm -hmm. down here. So most of the training camps were established in some of the states. Okay. But it it took um, General Pershing in command of the army, he said, I'm going to need at least a million combat troops to start fighting effectively. So um, that took a long time to get trained and to get in France because the only way to get France is by troop ship. You know, the government commandeered ocean liners, passenger liners, they commandeered everything to convert into, into ships to get supplies, material, and man. And, and, and the best the Navy ever did was they landed 10,000 men in one day. Well, if you need an army of a million men, how long is it going to take? And, and it's not just the combat guys, it's all the support troops. So, so it was about 2 million men that had to get France. And even if you did 10,000 a day, that's 200 days. Just, a lot just, of work. just getting them to France. That is a lot so, of work. And, and, and at the end of the war, um, how long does it take to get those guys home? The same amount of time. So, so we still had men in France um, after the war was ended um, into the summer of 1919. Guys were still waiting for boat space. Goodness. Okay. It's, it's an interesting war. Yeah. And it's, in, it's an interesting facet here at Chickamauga. A lot of people just don't know. Well, I think this about wraps up my World War I video here at Chickamauga Battlefield. I hope you enjoyed this experience just as much as I did. Loved learning about the connection of the two wars at this one battlefield just really really neat to see all the living historians and all the awesome information that i learned and just some really cool history so thank you as always for watching if you like this sort of stuff please be sure to subscribe because each and every week i do post new videos of me visiting historical sites and national parks and you wouldn't want to miss out on any of that youtube.com slash tnphotobug is my url my youtube channel so till next time this is history buff tnphotobug signing out and i am indeed having a blast with the past.